Occupy Love represents, I think, as a, as a, certainly as the filmmakers, our attempt to capture what we feel was the, the core thread of certainly of that movement, but also this underlying expression of what's trying to be born, what's trying to come through, I think, all of us. And I've come to understand it as a form of emerging consciousness, which in the sense of, it sounds like, you know, a heady idea, but it's, you know, we're kind of reaching the point, what I believe is the, the limitations of an egoic consciousness, which is, was really important in the development of humanity to, to be able to recognize yourself as separate. And yet at the same time, there's a real danger of falling into that, therefore you're only separate, like forgetting the part that you're actually fundamentally interconnected to everything else. And so I think what's happening now is we're, we're realizing essentially the shadow of the ego as an important piece of revolutionary development, but at the same time needs to remain in relationship with interdependence. And so Occupy Love is our way of showing how collectively I think we're starting to understand it. And that emergent consciousness itself is actually the unification of those two, like the, the ego and the whole. And so, you know, I think it's really important for people to be able to see it from that perspective. Otherwise, you, if you're trapped in the, in the, you know, individual personification of what you see happening, then you start saying things like, oh, it's just a bunch of hippies in the park, or like, what are their demands? Like, from that lens, it's very hard to see the, what's actually going on. So Occupy Love, uh, for us, is attempting to give people that big picture so they can recognize how this longing for unification is actually coming through in many, many different ways. Like, it doesn't necessarily mean just a collective movement, right? It can come across in, I mean, the, very, the internet itself, I think, is actually a, a physical construction of um, our actual interdependence. And so it's happening all around us, but more and more people need to recognize it. I had seen Velcro's two previous films, uh, Scared Sacred and Fierce Light. And uh, when I heard he was actually working on a third film of the trilogy, uh, I knew I had to get involved. I just finished uh, my previous feature called One Week Job. It's about a guy who worked 52 jobs in a year. He's trying to find his passion. And uh, what happened, this is in 2010, Velcro was doing a workshop in Vancouver. And so I contacted, well, I, I attended the workshop. And then afterwards, we, everybody went out for beers and I introduced myself and we started chatting. And then uh, I basically just kept emailing him afterwards and said, you know, can I help out? And uh, he kind of like said, okay, but he gets a fair amount of people. And so it's always hard to know if anybody's serious, right? They actually will stick it out. And I kept emailing. Finally, he's like, okay. And so we went and shot at uh, the Alberta Tar Sands. That was the first scene we shot together. And uh, ended up being, I mean, for me, it's one of the most powerful scenes in the film. And uh, from there, he's like, oh, we work pretty well together. And uh, just continued until now I'm a producer. As a producer, my role was a little bit of everything. So that includes things like, um, you know, we ran two Kickstarter camp or a Kickstarter campaign and Indiegogo to raise uh, 84,000 for the film. Um, you know, I, I dabbled in uh, the cinematography, so I did shoot uh, some of the key interviews, uh, Naomi Klein, uh, Heart Traveler. So I, I was part of that role. Um, the design, you know, the marketing of the film, was, we're all heavily involved in that together with the other producer, Nova, and me. And, um, you know, you know this tour, putting the tour on, logistics, like, as I say, a little bit of everything, actually. So, I mean, I'd never been a producer before, and so a huge learning curve, certainly for me. But, uh, I mean, I've really enjoyed the journey. So when I came on board, Occupy Love was actually uh, called Evolve Love. So in 2010, when I joined, Velcro had been asking the question, how can the climate crisis become a love story? for at least a year and a half. And uh, he'd been going around to different climate summits and, and speaking with artists and activists and leaders. And, you know, he got a varying types of responses. And, uh, you know, when I came on board, we ended up shooting in the Tar Sands and the Cancun Climate Summit. And, and it seemed like a lot of the philosophers and scientists and artists, they were speaking about this collective expression uh, unfolding, this movement of movements. And we were seeing hints of it, but we never really saw, uh, uh, or we never were able to capture 
it, the unfolding itself until late fall 2011 when Belcor went down to Zuccotti Park to, to shoot what was called the Occupy Movement right at the time. And uh, from there, you realize right away that it was significant, that there was something different about previous movements. So he proceeded to film it. And you know, we realized pretty early on ourselves that this was an expression of what everyone else was talking about. And so Velcro likes to say the film got occupied, and uh, hence the title Occupy Love. So it, it shows, I think, the journey of, of most documentaries, actually, where you, you, know, you have an inkling of what you might be following or capturing, and yet it becomes something emergent over time. And often, I think, you do recognize it when you see it. I think love itself needs to be reappropriated, to be honest, because we've come to believe that it means infatuation, right? It means desire. Uh, and I think that we're starting to understand that love itself is a, is a willingness to act out of interdependence. So to, to be able to express it. Love can't be stagnant, can't be static. Love only becomes love when it's expressed. And so I think what we're starting to understand is that, you know, when you, every type of relationship you have can itself be an expression of love. Even if it's just simply like presence, right? Just your presence alone can be enough to shift somebody's own presence and, and to tune them more into the interdependency, you could say, which then that'll go out and ripple out into their relationships and then their relationships. Because from the interdependent paradigm, it seems that that is the, actually the only way to create uh, a shift necessary. It's not going to happen from, you know, yelling at people from the rooftops, right? It's not going to happen from forcing people to change their decisions, because often they'll just dig in, right? They they will they'll resist change even further. And so I think what's being asked of us, Thomas Hubel is a spiritual teacher who um, I've done collaborations with, and he has this great phrase which he says, we must come from the future. And what he means by that is not this idea of linear time in the future, but that we're being called to embody the future consciousness now. And so in that sense, it's very unlikely that there's suddenly going to be a mass shift you know, into this new age all of a sudden. And I think a lot of people around 2012 are kind of either hoping or that Jesus would come down or like aliens would come down. And right, they're all very similar ideas around basically, will we be saved from an external force outside of ourselves, right? Because we're feeling so stuck in our ability to create change ourselves. And so we want this big external force to come in and make it for us. And so I think what we're starting to understand now, certainly is 2012 is behind us, and most of the things are still here, right? We're starting to uh, understand that it's not going to happen in a mass shift. It's going to happen in pockets. And then these pockets will start to link up to each other and create this um, web of the new paradigm on top of the old. And I think there will be a tipping point at some sometime. I don't know when it's going to be. And I think we can't be focused on this idea that there's going to be a, a mass tipping point anytime soon. Because the work, I think, is, is necessary to be able to do the work anyway, right where we are. Our last question. What is your dream for, for the world? <laughs> My dream for the world? Um, I gotta think about that, that's a big question. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Take your time. <laughs> okay. My dream for the world is... My dream for the world would be to see a dream. That, you know, I feel I walk around a lot of the time now in awe of everything. And whether it's the trees, you know, waving in the sunlight, or the dog sniffing around, you know, the corner, or just the the uh, diligence of people to go about their lives and in their own unique way, and even unconsciousness, even unconsciousness is a type of uh, beauty. And so for me, I just try to recognize the beauty in everything and that 
my dream would be for if more people I think saw beauty and recognized beauty and everything, they're much more likely to be able to relinquish their um, personified universe and actually drop into the the magic of what it is to exist at all and be in gratitude simply for having the opportunity. Right? That for me is worth existing in the first place. <laughs>